Yeah, let's have some fun. All right. Well, welcome. We have our small little community of MF peers here, but keep in mind that we are going to record this and share with a lot of those who have signed up and just for the greater good of individuals who would like this knowledge that Amy is going to present to us. So again, welcome ladies, gentlemen, Prince. This is the second nutrition webinar that Amy is hosting for us. And the first one was very valuable with just getting us an understanding to the basics, right? What do we need to think about uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to start to create habits? And this is going to be a continuation as Amy's going to go into for us uh, about all the good things with nutrition labels. But yeah, just keep in mind, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to get together and learn about the essentials that Amy will present. So I'm going to put this into Amy's hands here. She's going to share a presentation and uh, yeah, buckle up. <laughs> all righty, crew. So I'm going to do a screen share here so we can all see it. And then like Marco said, this is and what we kind of put on the Facebook group already. This is going to be about fact labels, so nutrition facts. And some of this might be a little straightforward. And then some of this is going to be like, oh, like, hey, you didn't know that about nutrition facts labels and things like that. So moving right along into it. Oh, and any questions you have, throw them in the chat. That way we'll just save them to the end, just in case I do happen to answer them along the way. And then we can always circle back and we can get that um, squared away for you guys. So I think most of you do know me, but some of you might not know me too well yet if you're a little bit newer. Uh, so I'm Amy Landis, owner and founder of Fueling Fitness Nutrition, as well as coach and nutritionist for CrossFit MFP. I received my Bachelor's of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics from Westchester University. I'm also a USA Weightlifting Level 1 Certified Coach, CrossFit Level 1 Coach, and I have a, a Personal Training and nutrition, Nutritionist Certification through the National Personal Training Institute. Prior to some of that, I did uh, instruct martial arts for about five and a half years before I got into CrossFit, and then I trained and studied the art for about 15 years, and that kind of butt up right to the end of my martial arts into CrossFit kind of overlapped a little bit. But with all of that, I have about 15 years total of coaching experience, if you combine the two, and then about nine years now of just nutrition coaching experience with that couple other sports experience. So martial arts, equestrian, track and field, did that in grade school, powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, and CrossFit itself. So a variety there. And before we do talk about nutrition facts labels, I do want to bring this uh, mindset piece to you guys. And if you are part of the Facebook Cro uh, CrossFit MFP group, our nutrition group, this might look a little familiar. So it's about creating habits and changing your lifestyle. And that takes more than just repeat effort. It takes a mindset shift to help those efforts become effortless. So the more positive things you can do on autopilot, the easier it is to stack good habits on top of each other. So it's also important to remember that messing up or missing a habit once doesn't mean you lost or you failed in that habit and what you're trying to form. But it does mean that you want to try to get back on track as soon as that next opportunity arises so you can continue to build off that habit and really make it the habit that you want it to be. So just a few things here that I want you to keep in mind, because as we go through all of this, it might be a little overwhelming, but you don't have to do it all at once. So instead of dwelling on what went wrong, so if you miss something or make a mistake, recognize what went right. So what were you trying to do that went well with it? Instead of thinking you have to remove foods, begin thinking you want to add in more healthy food options. So instead of saying, I have to, so oh, I have to go do eat my vegetables or go get my protein sources, you get to go do those things. You get to eat health, fresh vegetables. You get to go eat fresh protein from the, the store and things like that. Instead of an all or nothing approach, you have to be 100% on it or you're absolutely absolutely not there. Think of just 1% better each day. I'm just going to make sure I'm a little better than I was yesterday, even if I'm not exactly where I want to be yet. So that might take some effort to remind yourself to change the way you think, but eventually your outlook will be a lot better when it comes to nutrition. So you're improving that relationship. So I just want you to keep all of this in mind as we move through the presentation. 
So it might be a good idea to either have something from your pantry nearby, a nutrition label to look at, or at least have a little piece of paper and a notepad so you can take some notes that you want to then refer to when you look at some labels. And then again, just save those questions till the end. So let's dive in. You can see this nice, colorful fact sheet right here. This is an example of a label. This isn't associated with a particular food that I have. It's just an example that shows everything that's required on a label. So you'll see that there's serving size and number of servings in the blue at the top there, amount of calories per serving moving into that pink section, all the various nutrients listed in the yellow, and then in the purple, you have the percent daily value of nutrients. That's based off a 2000 calorie diet. And then I'll take you down to that footnote section. So we'll, and we'll talk more in detail, but that's going to pertain to the daily value. So they're, they're gonna go hand in hand. And then under these labels is usually where you'll see your ingredient listed on the package, sometimes next to it as well. So we're gonna go step-by-step step through that label with more detail. So all the nutrition information on each label is based on one serving of food, unless it's otherwise stated. So you'll see that you have eight servings per container here, and then it's one serving is that two thirds cup or 55 grams in weight of that particular food, whatever it might be. So how do companies come up with these serving sizes? Well, by law, a serving size must be based on the amount of food people typically consume rather than how much they should consume. So that's really important. It's not going to be what you should be consuming in that package. It's what's the average that people are going to typically consume when they sit down to eat it. Now, you might be thinking, well, that seems kind of silly. The amount that I would typically consume is probably different than somebody else's. You're exactly right. The amount you should consume or the amount that you're going to consume is going to be different than person to person. So that serving size isn't trying to tell you exactly what you should eat in that package. The amount that you should consume is going to vary depending on your goals and your biometrics. So the serving size is not a re recommendation, like I said, of how much you should eat or drink in that package. It's just letting you know about how much is typically consumed at a time. So one package of food may contain more than one serving, which you'll see, you see in this example here, this has eight total servings in the container, right? And then it micrograms that out into these eight different pieces. So two thirds cup, 55 grams. So you keep that in mind where the rest of nu the nutrition is based off one serving, not the container, unless it's otherwise stated. A couple times on packages, you might have what's called a dual column. So you'll have a column of this is one serving and there will be a number of servings listed for the package. A second column that says the entire package has this many grams of X, Y, Z and this many calories in the whole package. So there could be dual column labels as well. It'll tell you one serving and the entire package. So adding on to that, you'll see that you have the amount of calories per serving. So in this one in particular, you'll see that with your two thirds cup, your 55 grams in weight, you're gonna get 230 calories. That's pretty straightforward with that. And then next up here, so looking at the nutrition and percent daily value on this list. So you have all the nutrients listed in that yellow and then percent daily value listed in purple. So. This list of nutrients is the amount of nutrients in a single serving, just like we've been talking about so far. It's all for one single serving. So in this example, one serving was your two thirds cup or 55 grams in weight of that food in the package. And then the amount of food gets broken down into the 230 calories, where those calories come from listed in the yellow is broken into your total fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrates, protein, vitamins, and minerals. So we're gonna break out each of those sections as well. And then at the end, we'll talk about what that percent daily value means for all those nutrients. So looking at our total fat, there's a lot of misconception that lingers around dietary fat still. The good thing about nutritional science is that we are continuing to learn what the human diet should look like. Dietary fat does not automatically make you gain body fat. That's very important. An overconsumption of calories from any macronutrient, fat, carbs, protein, can increase body fat. So it's about your calories, not necessarily where those calories come from. And you'll see that in the fat section, you're broken down into total fat, saturated fat, and trans fat. 
Those are the things required on a nutrition label. Some labels might have unsaturated fat in there as well. It's not a requirement, but a company might choose to put that on there. So saturated fat is also not inherently bad for you. Your risk of things like cardiovascular disease, high cholesterol, and other diseases is more likely from environmental factors and those dietary habits, more like smoking, not exercising, not getting sunlight, not getting fresh air, and not eating an overall well-balanced diet. It's not just going to be from your fat content. And then looking at that trans fat, again, something else that's required to be put on these labels, there's two types of trans fats found in foods, the naturally occurring and the artificial. So the naturally occurring trans fats are found in very small amounts in meats and dairy products. And these aren't harmful when everything's being paired with a well-balanced diet. And they're also in small amounts. So you're not getting an overabundance when you're eating good, healthy protein sources and dairy. So artificial trans fats are created in the industrial process of adding hydrogen to liquid vegetable oil to make them more solid. So vegetable oil would be liquid at room temperature. When we put this through the hydrogen hydrogenation process, hydrogenation, excuse me, that's when we'll make our liquid form of vegetable oil into a solid. So they're taking unsaturated fats, which are liquid at room temperature, making them more saturated and your saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Think of butter, things like that. So it kind of went over that a little bit. We have this example here, Crisco, vegetable oils are naturally unsaturated, which means again, at room temperature, they're gonna be in that liquid form. To get them more solid at room temperature, the vegetable oil will need to be hydrogenated. Think of things like Crisco. It's a solid form of vegetable oil. This is not a natural state for vegetable oil. It would be found in. You would be better off using something like coconut oil or butter instead of Crisco because coconut oil and butter is naturally saturated rather than being in a manufactured saturated form. So you're looking at something natural versus artificial. We always want to go for those naturally occurring forms of food. And in packaged and processed foods, the primary source of trans fats comes from partially hydrogenated oils. Again, we're looking at that artificial trans fat. Back in November of 2013, the FDA determined that partially hydrogenated oils are no longer recognized as being safe in human food. So it's a good idea to check the ingredients list for partially hydrogenated oils. And just because the FDA recognized them to not be safe doesn't mean that they were required to be taken out of food. So they're not banned per se. So you do want to keep that in mind. You might still find them in foods. And then this is just an example where you can see there's fully hydrogenated oils as well as partially hydrogenated cottonseed and soybean oils. So just for reference of what you'd be looking for on that label, if you were hoping to keep those out, which it is recommended to do so. And then to sum it up with dietary fat, don't be afraid of it. You need to consume dietary fat for a variety of reasons. It provides vitamin, it's vitamins and minerals to the body aids in the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. So you're looking at vitamin A, D, E, and K. This means without fat present, we can't properly absorb those vitamins. So we need fat in our diet. And it provides energy for aerobic activity. So you're thinking about your long, slow, steady endurance style workouts, getting you through that. You're looking at more of that aerobic state, which is gonna come from your fats. So don't be afraid of body fat stores either. They do pr provide insulation for the body through the cold. So we need some. It's healthy to have body fat stores. We just don't want an overabundance because then it can go in the other direction. So too much of anything can be bad, right? Too much a good thing. And another thing is our brain is made of 60% fat and it relies on fat for proper functioning. So there are benefits to body fat as well as dietary fat. We just always want to have everything in balance. So moving through here to the cholesterol and sodium section, again, these are two things required to be on nutrition facts labels. So dietary cholesterol does not instantly raise your blood cholesterol. That's important. So if you eat something with cholesterol, you're not instantly raising your blood levels of cholesterol. Just like consuming saturated fat, consuming cholesterol is not the sole reason for high cholesterol. Again, things like smoking, lack of exercise, 
lack of vegetables and a balanced diet, lack of sunlight and high stress are all gonna contribute to raising cholesterol levels, not just eating it. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, fiber, which we are gonna talk about in the next slide here, that can remove cholesterol from the blood, helping to regulate total cholesterol amount. So if you do have high cholesterol, making sure you're getting a lot of good fiber is gonna help you reduce those levels. And cholesterol is not all bad news. It's very important for the creation of cells, vitamins, and hormones in the body. So we do need it. It's just that we don't want it in an overabundance, just like anything else. And then sodium, it's an essential electrolyte, and it's needed in large amounts because it plays a key role in normal nerve and muscle function. So it's very important for sending all those single signals throughout the body. Sodium is, not, is also not inherently bad for you. So again, too much of a bad thing or too much of a good thing can be bad. If you are sweating a lot in a gym, you're gonna need to replace your sodium more than a non-active individual. So every time you guys leave MFP from a good workout, you were probably sweating a decent bit, some days more than others. You're gonna need to at least replace some of that sodium. Maybe you don't need a whole lot, but it's all gonna depend on your individual biometrics. Are you a salty sweater? So do you lose more salt than the average person? And that's just something that would be very individual, individualized person to person. So having salt in your food is not bad. You just also wanna just keep in mind, do you have any issues related to like blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, things like that. So both cholesterol and sodium play necessarily necessary role in the body, but like anything, Again, too much of a good thing can be bad. <clears throat> Though both are necessary, it is important to recognize what your food is made up of. So if you do know, again, if you do know you're dealing with something like cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure, you will wanna just focus in on adding in more whole foods. So that's that mindset. I don't wanna just say, hey, I wanna remove cholesterol, I wanna remove sodium. No, I wanna add in whole foods. They're naturally low in cholesterol and sodium. And the fiber you're gonna get from those are going to help you with your cholesterol levels. So just be aware of those labels with that. So carbohydrates, getting into this one here. It's one of the prime energy sources for the body. And it's from your organ function to walking to hitting a workout. Carbohydrates are the most readily available fuel source, and it's every athlete's best friend. Even if you're not a high-performing athlete, you still need carbohydrates. On a nutrition facts label, you're going to see total carbohydrate and then some subcategories such as dietary fiber, total sugar, and added sugar. So dietary fiber, and this is what we kind of refer to with cholesterol, it comes in two forms. You have insoluble and soluble. So your soluble fiber, it dissolves and creates a gel-like form. <clears throat> and this gel-like feature will help to bind cholesterol. And then it's going to remove it from the body through your bowel movements. So it's going to go around, find the cholesterol, find these products, bind to it, take it out of you. And then your insoluble fiber, it's going to promote good bowel health. So they go hand in hand. The insoluble fiber is going to bring water to your stool, to your bowels, and it's going to help soften everything so it passes a little bit more easily. So if you do have any issues with constipation, it's not just, hey, drink more water, but it's make sure you're getting some insoluble fiber to bring the water to the bowels to help with everything to pass. So fiber can be found in fruits, veggies, nuts, seeds, whole grains. So as long as you eat a variety of those foods, you're gonna get both soluble and insoluble fiber. Another aspect of carbohydrate section that we're seeing here is the sugar. So this includes naturally occurring sugar as well as the added sugar. So the added sugar is the amount of sugar a manufacturing company added to the product. So this is best to be mindful of sugar content in general, but especially the added sugar. Sugar is not bad, but again, when we're adding more and more and more to our food, we're going to get too much of that thing. We don't want so much sugar. The naturally occurring sugar in food would be a better option, like say fruit over a packaged item. And you can see with this label example, there's 12 grams of total sugar and 10 of the 12 is going to be added to the product. So there's only two grams of naturally occurring in this scenario here. And then just some other benefits of carbohydrates. It supplies energy to the body for all daily activities. It provides energy to your brain as well. It's needed for the growth and repair of your cells and tissues. 
It provides a wide variety of vitamins and minerals. So there's your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, and then it's going to give you that good for you fiber to keep those bowels regular. So very, very important to get your carbohydrates in a variety of forms. And then up next, we've got our protein. So protein is one of the most important components of our diet. It's not just important because we need to build stronger muscles, right? We're all in the gym trying to get stronger, but we also need protein for every structure in the body. Think of it as the wood, the bricks, the cement, the nails, and the concrete that's used to build a structure for our body. That's protein to build out cells, hair, nails, of course, our muscles and repair. It's good for your bone health. So we need it for more than just like, oh, protein, I'm going to get big and strong. We need it for everything. And then when you do get sore from a workout, though, protein will support that healing process. So on a label, this particular label with three grams of protein per serving would be considered a low source. So it's low in protein. Anything about less than five grams would be considered low. Five to 10 would be considered a moderate source. And then if you're looking at 10 or more, you're looking at, hey, this is a good source or a higher source of protein. Now, all of that is a little relative to what else is in the food. So whatever the other uh, fats and carbohydrates are saying, if it's extremely high in carbs, let's say there was 10 grams of protein and that's considered now like, hey, we're getting to the high area, but we've got 30 grams of carbs. Well, the carb to protein ratio, it's more of a carb source than it is a protein source. So everything's a little bit relative with that as well. And everybody's protein needs are based on their own individual biometrics. So what would be good a good source of protein for one person might not be enough for the next person and vice versa. And then other benefits of protein, which we said a few of these, you need it for your bone health. It's helping to build stronger immune system. It's aiding in muscular contraction and coordination. It's helping to renew and restore cells and tissues. It's aiding in nervous system functioning, and it increases the satiety of your meals, AKA will help you feel fuller throughout that meal. So it's gonna satisfy you a little bit more. So we gotta talk about those vitamins and minerals as well. The amount of vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium has to be listed on the label. So that's what you're seeing here. These are the requirements for all labels. Other vitamins and minerals may be listed voluntarily by a manufacturer, but they're not required. So keep that in mind. There might be more or less in your food, but they have to list these. Even if the quantity is zero, it doesn't matter. They have to put it on there and say zero. Some vitamins and minerals are added into a food product, making that product fortified in additional vitamins and minerals. That might be a word you guys have heard before. So like your milk is fortified in extra vitamin D or calcium or things like that. So this is done to increase the nutritional value of a food product or to restore nutrients that are lost in the manufacturing process. So when we are creating these food products, some vitamins and minerals are destroyed. So they might add those back in to increase that value of that food product. Although only a small list of vitamins and minerals are required to be listed, any vitamin and mineral that the food is fortified in, so if it's not one of these four that you see, but they're saying, hey, we fortified this in, let's say vitamin C, they have to now list vitamin C on it and say the amount because they're saying we put it in there, they have to now tell you that. So if that statement is made that the package is increasing and, and if it's um, saying it's increasing a positive health benefit. So not just we fortified it, but now we're saying, hey, this has a good health benefit because of this. They have to make sure they list that. Um, so an example you might see would be if a food product claims it's a good source of antioxidants, right? There's a variety of different antioxidants like vitamin A and E. If it's saying that it's a good source of antioxidants to support, say, your heart health, they must now state that on the label if it's not already there. Another feature is that it requires nutrients to be listed is that the product is claiming it's high or low in a nutrient. So if the product claims it's high in vitamin C, and we know vitamin C, again, is not typically listed here, they now have to say, okay, we're putting vitamin C on there or this, even though it's not a required listing, we're going to say our product is high in vitamin C, whether they put it in there or not, they have to list that because they're making a claim based off of that nutrient. So it's just things that 
they're going to be required to put or to not put on a label, depending on how they're wording it. They can't say that it's good for you for a certain reason, but not tell you why it's good for you for that reason. So again, the nutrient section is showcasing where the calories come from and how much sodium, cholesterol, vitamins, and minerals are in the food product. So the footnote section down there in gray, we're going to kind of drop down to that. That states the percent daily value tells you how much a nutrient in a serving of food contributes to a daily diet. 2000 calories a day is used for general nutrition advice. So what does that statement mean exactly? This is gonna tell you how much one serving of food contributes to meeting the daily requirements of that nutrient. And then you see kind of in that purple highlighted section that it's got all these percents. Keep in mind, this is based off of if you were to eat 2000 calories a day. So as a general rule, eating 2000 calories a day for any active adult is not advised unless you are in a controlled short-term calorie deficit for something like weight loss. A caloric total less than 2000 calories for most active adults is not gonna be sustainable. So in most cases, these percents are not going to be perfect measurements. So if you look at that label and you're like, oh, calcium, I'm getting 20% of the daily calcium I need, but it's based off of if you were to only eat 2000 calories and you probably need more than that, whether you know it or not, you are not then getting 20% of your daily calcium need because your requirement is greater. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at those percents. For the most part, they're not gonna be perfect scenario for you, but it does give you an idea of the percentages or the amounts that are in things. If you didn't know like, all right, calcium, 260 milligrams, what does that mean? All right, roughly 20% is what you could say of your daily need, you could get it from this food product. But just know it's gonna vary from person to person for those uh, daily values. And then again, here's a full form of that list showing everything that we just went over. So you have the serving size and the number of servings, the amount of calories per serving, all various nutrients that are gonna be listed from your macronutrients to your vitamins and minerals, your fiber, things like that. The percent daily value of nutrients, again, based off a 2000 calorie diet. And then in the footnotes, just telling you that those percent daily values are based off 2000 calories. So there was a change not too long ago to labels. And I just wanna bring this to your attention so you're aware. If you go into your pantry, you might find that some labels look a little different. That's because back in 2018, the FDA rolled out a new version of the Nutrition Facts labels. Just some main differences that you might see are larger font sizes in the calories and that serving size. Another main difference is in the percent daily value section. It used to break down not just for a 2000 calorie diet, but also a 2500 calorie diet. So it would have two sections for that. Now you might think, well, oh, that additional information could be pretty helpful because now I can see it off 2000 and something above 2000, but you might not have a calorie need of 2,500. So that percent's not going to still not be the best for you, maybe, but it might just give you another way to look at it. Either way, you just know that that's a rough estimate of the percents. And then one final difference is that they include on the new label, the added sugar. So they didn't used to include this, but now they're going to let you know, and a manufacturing company has to let you know how much sugar that they themselves added into that product. So I think that's an important one because we do want to try to avoid or limit our added sugar because it's just going to be uh, better for achieving a healthy lifestyle. Now, sugar is not inherently bad for you, but... Again, if we get too much sugar and not enough natural occurring nutrients, that's when things could go wrong. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention in case you do come across the old food label, even though in most cases you're going to interpret it roughly the same, you might just see some of those differences. So we're going to touch on the ingredients list. So here we have uh, Honey Nut Cheerios, and I chose this because it's a pretty well-known cereal. We're going to zoom in onto the nutrient list in just a moment, or the ingredients list, excuse me. We don't really have time to decipher every single ingredient on the list and determine if you should or shouldn't eat the food product that it contains, like if it has those ingredients in it. But the purpose of the next slide is just to make you aware of how ingredients are listed on a package and just to encourage you to check those ingredients and see what you have so you know what you're eating. 
So here is the ingredients list of Honey Nut Cheerios. And it's a little bit blurry because I had to zoom in pretty big here. The ingredients of a food item are listed from the most prevalent to the least. So this means the first ingredient is going to be the most abundant. It's going to come in the most amount for that food product. And the last ingredient will be in the smallest quantity in that food item. So it goes in chronological order from most to littlest, least. Some food products, such as this Honey Nut Cheerio cereal, is going to be fortified in additional vitamins and minerals, which we talked about that process of fortification and that they would have to then list that. So you can see under the ingredients is a long list of vitamins and minerals, and some of those were not naturally occurring in the food, whether they lost them in the process of making this food or they just wanted to add them in to increase the value so the food seems like a healthier option to choose. So in Honey Nut Cheerios, we have for the ingredients, you've got a list of the first one you're going to see here is the whole grain oats. And then we see it has sugar, oat bran, cornstarch, honey, brown sugar syrup, tripotassium phosphate, which is just a water soluble salt, rice brand oil and or canola oil natural almond flavor and vitamin E added for as a preservative. So they had to list that like, hey, we're putting this vitamin in E in here for that preservative. After that, there's the list of all the vitamins and minerals that are either naturally occurring or added. So you'll see a much longer list than the standard four that you need to see. We've got calcium, zinc, iron, vitamin C, vitamin A, a variety of B vitamins and vitamin D. So a lot in there. You might be thinking, wow, this is great. Look at all these vitamins and minerals I'm getting in the cereal. However, I do want to draw your attention to the ingredients once more. You have sugar, honey, and brown sugar syrup. No matter how you write it, these three ingredients are forms of added sugar. So you might be gaining a variety of vitamins and minerals, but you're also gaining a lot of additional sugar. Now, again, sugar is not inherently bad for you. However, we just need to be aware of that where it's like, okay, I'm going to get all these vitamins and minerals, but I'm going to get it in a high sugar form. So is that something that I want to eat or am I better off eating a variety of fruits and vegetables that will also give me these vitamins and minerals, but will give me fiber and better quality food overall. So after the presentation, if you head over to your pantry or fridge, you can go ahead and look at some labels and just take a look and become aware of what's in it. And then you can determine if you think that's something you would want to continue eating or not. So I want to do a comparison here of a food product versus a whole food. So we have banana chips, organic banana chips from Trader Joe's and a regular old banana. So organic banana chips sounds pretty good because it's organic, right? It's from Trader Joe's. We all love Trader Joe's. And then you look at the ingredients, which we will in a moment, and there's only three of them. So it's like, all right, that's pretty good. I'm doing a good job. And then we have the banana. So we're just going to go through a little bit of this. So this is the banana chips label for the nutrition facts. As you can see, the serving size is 13 pieces or 30 grams in weight of those banana chips. Each serving, so each grouping of 13 pieces is going to get you 160 calories. Each serving also contains 11 grams of fat, 13 total grams of carbohydrates, and then zero grams of protein. So they're listing that out there for you. And again, the ingredients, which you can see here, organic bananas, organic coconut oil, and organic evaporated cane juice, aka sugar, make it a little bit more sweet. It also contains no vitamin A or vitamin C, but does contain some calcium and iron. So they have to list those there for you. Now let's take a look at bananas. So bananas don't come with a nutrition facts label from the store because they're a single ingredient. It's just a banana. But if you go on the internet, quick Google search, banana nutrition facts, it'll spit out the facts of a banana. In this case, it's for a medium banana, which they're saying is roughly seven inches long for a single serving. And you can always on the internet put in, you know, small banana, large banana. You can decipher that. You can just do a Google search. So with a medium banana, again, about seven inches long, your total calories are 105 calories per serving. So per banana, less than a gram of fat, about 27 grams of total carbohydrates, and just over one gram of protein per medium banana. 
You'll also see the vitamins and minerals that are naturally occurring in this banana listed, which are calcium, iron, potassium, vitamin A, and vitamin C. And again, those are natural in there. Nobody had to add those. If we put these side by side for a good comparison here of the banana chips, which is on the right, those are more calorically dense. So this term means that for less weight and volume of the food, so you have those 13 pieces, so 13 pieces compared to that medium banana, you're gonna eat less volume of 13 pieces versus that whole banana that you would eat. This essentially means you're eating less for more calories. So that's what caloric density means with these foods. So banana chips are more calorically dense. And I want you to think about if you were to eat a medium banana versus one serving of banana chips, again, those 13 pieces, which do you think would fill you up more and leave you feeling more satisfied in terms of your hunger? If I were to take a guess, most of you are probably going to say eating the whole medium banana is going to make you feel a little bit more full than, again, only 13 pieces of the banana chips. Some of you might be thinking that you would need to eat about a third of the bag of banana chips to feel satisfied, right? It's very easy to do with something like that. It's sweet, it's salty, it has those good fats in it that we like, that good combination. So let's kind of take a look at what that would look like in terms of a serving that would be more realistic for us to eat versus 13 pieces. So a medium banana is 105 calories, boom. The bag of banana chips has 15 servings in the bag. If we were to take that third, right? Oh, I might eat about a third of the bag to make myself satisfy satisfied. That's five servings. So we need to do a little multiplication here of the total calories. So 160 total calories in one serving, but times that by five because we're eating a third of the bag. When we do that, that's 800 calories. A big difference compared to our 105 calories for one banana. Now that's 65 pieces of banana chips. So you're probably not sitting there counting out 65 pieces as you go along like, all right, I'm going to get myself to those 800 calories, but you're most likely going to eat more than 13. So maybe it's not the full 65 pieces, but it's more than 13. So you're now looking at, again, that 105 calories from a medium banana compared to close to 800 if you were to eat roughly that third of the bag, which most of us probably are capable of doing, let's be honest. And let's not forget those vitamins and minerals. So we wanna take a look at that. A banana is gonna give you a wider range of vitamins and minerals compared to the banana chips. And that's partly because the process of making banana chips is going to destroy some of the nutrients that are naturally found in bananas. Now you will have a little bit more nutrients, you could say for the calcium and iron, just because you've got the coconut oil in there and you've got some sugar in there, right? There's other things in those banana chips. Lastly, we should touch on the macronutrient breakdown. So we're talking about fats, carbs, and protein. A banana would be considered a carbohydrate source because it's primarily made up of carbohydrates with 27 grams of carbs, less than a gram of fat, and just over a gram of protein. This is a primary carbohydrate source. Banana chips are almost equal, equal parts carbs and fat with 11 grams of fat per serving, and 13 grams of carbs per serving and no protein. So it's almost equal fat to carb ratio there. Now, I'm not saying either one of these is good or bad. You just should be aware of that. However, if we remember, most of us are going to eat more than one serving of those banana chips. So now we need to multiply 11 grams of fat and 13 grams of carbs by however many servings that we end up eating. If we use the same scenario, eating a third of the bag or five servings, we're going to be eating 55 grams of fat and 65 grams of carbohydrates. That's a big difference than what you just read on that label of 11 and 13. So again, just things to be aware of. And then you can see the significant difference here in a banana versus those banana chips. So the overall goal in a healthy, well-balanced diet is to eat the majority of your food from whole food sources, such as the banana and limit the amount of packaged food products like the banana chips. However, that does not mean you have to completely eliminate packaged food products altogether. Moderation is always key. And I do hope that this comparison of banana chips and the real banana opens your eyes to the potential health issues with weight loss and body composition goals that people are faced with. We just don't always realize how much we're eating. So if you're like, oh, I just can't seem to lose weight. You know, my snack is these really healthy banana chips. 
It's only got three ingredient, ingredients. They're organic. They're from Trader Joe's. Everybody loves TJ's, right? But when you're looking at, okay, how much are you actually eating versus how much would you eat if it was a banana? You can see the big discrepancy there. So just become aware of that and that can help reshape your relationship with food and maybe help you meet those body composition goals that you may or may not have. Maybe you don't have them, that's fine. But just something to be aware of. So we just went through an entire breakdown of nutrition labels and a lot of things to look out for with your food. But how do you kind of make changes? You're like, all right, well, I want to start looking at my labels, but like, what do I do? Well, the biggest thing that you can do is just begin adding in more whole foods. They don't require a label because you're eating whole foods. So add those in and that will automatically more or less make you eat less packaged food, right? Because you're going to be full. You're going to eat something better for you. So it's that mindset shift of, oh, do I, should I just remove those bad foods from my diet? I'm just not allowed to eat those rather than saying, no, I'm just going to eat more good foods. I'm going to eat more whole foods for me. So let's talk a little bit more about what that looks like. A simple way to start, and again, if you're in our Facebook nutrition group, this probably looks pretty familiar, but it's with the plate method. That's a very simple process to start with. Start choosing whole food options and less processed foods packed with those higher amounts of sodium, fat, and sugar. So what we're looking at is half of your plate of non-starchy veggies. That's going to get you good for you fiber, your vitamins, your minerals, all of that stuff. A quarter of your plate lean protein, whatever lean protein you like a quarter of your plate starchy carbohydrates, again, more fiber in there as well. And then just adding in some healthy, mindful fats. So you're just being mindful of that, or maybe you use them in the cooking process with some of these foods. So it is November 12th. Thanksgiving is 11 days away and Christmas will be here before we know it. The time to begin making changes to your diet is now. So don't wait until the holiday wishing you knew how to do something differently or after the holiday. Oh, I'm just going to wait till January 1st, till the new year. Why not just start now? So and don't think of the holidays as a blockade in your nutrition and in your wellness. Think of them as a learning experience where you can begin to apply your habits, even if it's not a full habit yet and it takes a little bit more work you can see where you need to improve. So you're gonna just begin to experiment with your food and begin to make better choices. That's that 1% that we're looking at versus that all or nothing. And then you'll feel, you more likely feel a lot better about getting through the holidays if you're being mindful versus if you were just like, huh, it's the holidays, I'm gonna do whatever. And then afterwards you're like, man, that really sucked. Or I wish I would have you know, paid attention more. And food is a really big focal point for the holidays, but the real magic is in the connections that we make with our families and friends. So taking the focus away from food entirely and then just putting more focus on enjoying the holiday season with family and friends is going to make that holiday season more meaning meaningful for you. So stop wishing that you will magically become healthier. If you just think about it, oh, I, I'm just, I really want to do this. I really want to be healthier. That doesn't do anything for you. You have to actually start taking a step toward making it happen. Even if it's a little baby step, one step is better than no steps. So how can you kind of begin putting this information into action, right? Think of that plate method. I want you to take the easiest task. You can look at this list, easiest thing on here, and you're going to try to do it every day. So eat a half your plate with veggies with lunch and dinner, incorporate protein with every meal and snack, drink 60 to 80 ounces of water a day, move your body daily for 30 minutes. Now, if you are a member of MFP, you already got the movement part down. So you can check that off your list. Maybe it's not every day. Maybe it's a couple times a week, but that's better than nothing. Maybe you go for a walk on those other days. Choose one thing and work toward mastering it over the next four weeks. And then once that new skill that you're trying to master becomes a habit that you don't have to think about, that's when you choose another one. Don't try to do them all at once. You'll probably overwhelm yourself. If you already have one that you're doing, great. Check it off and pick a different one. But that's going to be how you start working in these habits and you can gain this new per perspective on you know, shaping your wellness, we can call it. And you also have a new perspective on your nutrition labels that you can start making smart decisions about the food choices that you're making. So if you aren't in the habit of eating half your plate veggies with lunch and dinner, incorporating protein with every meal and snack, drinking 60 to 80 ounces of water a day, and moving your body daily for at least 30 minutes, that's where you have to begin with that list. 
So start with those habits. They make up the foundation of a healthy lifestyle and they're the habits we always look to build before we get into anything specific. So before you're able to really pursue that weight loss goal, that muscle gain goal or whatever that goal is, we got to do those things first, no matter what. They're, they're the foundation of everything. And no supplement or crash diet beats long-term healthy habits. A supplement and a crash diet is a short-term piece. Supplement, depending on its need, could be necessary. But that crash diet, I'm going to do keto for a while. I'm going to do paleo. Unless it's really sustainable for you, it's not going to last very long. So maybe you're already doing some of the things that I mentioned, which is great. And then you can focus in on more of the details. When you've already gotten down the basics, that's when you can move toward those individual nutritional needs. But if you do have trouble with the basics, you might need an accountability partner or somebody to give you clear direction. Both scenarios, somebody who mastered the basics and wants to get into the really nitty gritty details, and then somebody who just needs accountability to get those basics down, they can both benefit from one-on-one -on -one nutrition coaching. So a nutrition coach acts as a resource for accountability, troubleshooting, and knowledge, and they can be a really good guide for clear direction and give you a program to follow. Think of your MFP coaches. We guide you through a warm-up. We explain the workout of the day and give you direction on how to tackle that workout. And then you take that information and you start executing the program. And then we're there and we kind of wander around and correct your form and keep you on track but we give you these tools in this direction and you apply it. That's what nutrition coaching is. Maybe you feel like you're doing all the right things with your nutrition, but you can't seem to achieve your goal yet. A nutrition coach can give you an unbiased viewpoint of where to place your time and energy. Maybe you're just not looking at the right area and focusing on the right thing. So you can feel free to contact me if you are interested in learning more about this. Uh, for one-on-one -on -one coaching. But if that isn't your thing, if you're like, nope, nutrition coaching isn't for me, hey, that's fine. Another option is our free nutrition Facebook uh, group. It's members only, which I think most of you might be in it already, but that's a really good option because we'll post, I'll be posting a lot of different things related to nutrition week by week. And you can just use that information, information to experiment with your nutrition, try new recipes, try uh, a different habit, things like that. So just search for CrossFit MFP Nutrition on Facebook, and then you can ask to join if you're not already in there. And then a final reminder is that there's no magic pills to suddenly make you feel fit and healthy. It doesn't work that way. If you wanna be more physically fit, you have to begin putting in the work toward pushing your body to adapt and become more fit. If you want to be physically healthy, lose weight, or gain muscle, you have to examine your daily nutrition and begin to make a shift to gain those long-term healthy habits. If you have to live the lifestyle, you have to live the lifestyle that you want one habit at a time, right? You have to start making those changes. And with that, we are finished with our nutrition labels. Uh, presentation here, feel free to either throw something in the chat. I see there's a couple in there that I'll check, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, you are more than welcome to do so. <laughs> Some emojis by Marco. I like them. Uh, question in the chat. What recommendations would you have for rules of thumb on grams of protein fat per pound of body weight? That's a really good question. So I'll just take this off so we can kind of get full screen here. So recommendations for protein are a little bit more, are a little bit easier to do rather than say, oh, how much fat should you eat? Gram of one gram of protein per pound or just under that is usually a good place to be. That's, that's more of a general rule of thumb. So again, one gram per pound of body weight or just under one gram per pound, right? The more, more body weight you have, you don't need to eat. 200 to 300 grams of protein. So you can be like at a 180, 185 or somewhere around there. In terms of fat, that's a little bit more individual. It depends on your goals, right? Because we have to take into account how many grams of carbs might you need. Well, we have to factor in, okay, protein is a little bit more set and standard. Fat and carbs, what activity are you gonna do daily? So that's where that individual nutrition coaching would come into play because it depends person to person. A larger human, so this was Brendan, right? You're taller, you're a male. 
So you're going to need more of a potential nutrient. So I couldn't just say, oh, this many grams, because that's going to look different for somebody, say my height, five foot one female, that many grams for you would be too much for me, right? So that one's a little bit harder to do, but a good question nonetheless. Oh, we've got another one here. Is there a minimum requirement for trans fat to be required to show on the label? If it's less than one gram or something, might not know. Yeah, so with trans fat, there, the minimum requirement for, for all of the nutrients, if it's not quite a gram, they don't necessarily have to say it, which is a tricky one because that's where it's kind of like, okay, nutrition facts labels, they're you know, not exactly 100%. So they don't have to, if it's, if it's just under a certain amount, they don't have to put it on there. So keep that in mind, just because it says zero, it might not be fully zero. Now that's still in a low enough amount that it's probably not a huge deal, but that's why you want to look at the ingredients. The ingredients can kind of give you an idea of what the nutrient label should or would say, right? So if you do see those partially hydrogenated oils, there might be a little bit of trans fat in there, whether you or see it listed or not. So that's a good question too. Anything else about this that I can answer for you guys? Amy, I'm going to, I'll bring up a question for you for everybody here. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think going back to the the banana, right? <laughs> the banana analogy and the comparison, I think what typically we hear as coaches most often is, you know, like where they struggle with body composition or performance or something like that. And usually we're not aware of exactly, you know, how many, calories we're actually taking in just from maybe not being aware or mindful of labels. So could you just go into a, like a practical example, Let's say for example, I come to you and I'm a, you know, looking for nutrition coaching and, and, and help and guidance. What's a practical example, let's just say for a reaction standpoint of somebody who starts to work with you and they actually start mapping out like, you know, uh, their food through a daily and weekly basis. What's, What's that realization like for most people? And usually they're like, wow, I'm not eating, you know, as much or I'm maybe eating more. Like, what do you typically see with somebody that starts to work with you when they start to actually track these things and start to make notice of like, oh, hey, I'm much more aware because I'm tracking these and I'm maybe, you know, have to eat less because I'm not aware or maybe I need to eat more because I'm just not fueling for a specific purpose. Yeah. So if I interpret your question, I guess you want to know which uh, like scenario is more prevalent, like of, do they realize they're eating too much or too little? Is that right? Yeah. So it's a mixed bag. I mean, I've, I've worked with people who are under eating, who thought they were eating too much and would realize like, Hey, you're actually eat, not eating enough, which is probably why you're not achieving those weight loss or body composition goals. Cause if we under eat too much, the body's not going to want to move out of its homeostasis because it's in a state of stress. Same goes for now the overconsumption is pretty more straightforward of why somebody's not losing weight. Well, you're just eating too much. I'd say it's almost equal mixed bag both ways. Usually in the active community, I'd say for like women, they tend to under eat because that's just what we see in society is like eat less, eat less. That's how we'll lose weight. And I usually am encouraging women to just eat a little more, or maybe we're just shifting where the food's coming from. And it is eye opening for most people. Most people just don't realize. And that's why I wanted that scenario in there because most people just don't realize that, okay, it might be organic bananas, organic coconut oil, and it's still an organic sugar just for a little sweetness, but we're not eating just 13 pieces. So it's, and we might not be counting it at all. That might be one of the bigger parts is we're just not tracking anything. We just don't know. So it goes both ways in, you know, eating too much or under eating. And I would say most people, I would say across the board are just surprised at how much they are or aren't eating. That's a big thing, which is why I thought that piece was really important to have in there. So another question in the chat. So some good sources of snack protein. So this kind of depends on, um, you know, where you're going to be doing next. Are you heading to the gym right away that we want something of more quick absorption? Now, this is also where it's like, all right, snack protein, it, eating a protein bar is not bad. This would be a good example of when a packaged food item is going to be good. So an RX bar, 
it tends to have better ingredients than some other protein bars, but that's going to give you some protein in there that also comes with some carbs and fats. So be aware. This is where supplementing with something like protein powder can be really good because you know you're just getting protein. Again, this is another, you know, manufactured item, but it still has a purpose. So it's not that, you know, we go through this ingredients list, all packaged things are not bad. Um, other snack proteins could be like Greek yogurt. So we have like our protein bars, our Greek yogurt, uh, beef jerky of some sort is really good or a protein powder that can kind of give you some examples right off the bat if you're looking for a true protein source. But again, check the labels because some protein bars are going to have carbs and fat in there as well. So that's where you just want to be mindful. Another question here, what are some easy ways to track what you're eating, my fitness pal or something like that. My fitness pal is great. So if you do it, and then I would say whenever you're tracking, be unbiased. Don't suddenly change the way that you eat when you're going to track because then you don't actually know what was realistic. So if you're going to use my fitness pal, which I think is great, plug everything in there that you typically would eat just so you can see like, okay, this is a clear picture of a typical day or write it down. So just take a pen and paper and just write down as you go along the day of what the foods that you're eating, even if you don't know the exact amount, now you at least have a realistic view of the food items. But I would say my fitness pal is a really good choice because you will get the macronutrient breakdown with that as well. Any other questions? And then Marco did reply to other snacks, solid beef sticks that have middle in minimal ingredients. Those are a good example. Yeah. You just, again, look at the ingredients for whatever you're choosing, but yeah, beef jerky or beef sticks, great option as well. Nick sticks. Is that the, is that the brand? Yeah. Chomps. So yeah. Jeff, Chomps in yeah. there. Yeah. I forget. Um, Rachel and Rebecca got for my birthday. They gave me a bunch of these, these Nick sticks or whatever from mom's market. And I just, I okay. looked at the, I looked at the label because usually like you said, like with a lot of these labels, like typical beef jerky, it's like, it's, it's like beef jerky and a bunch of sugar and added ingredients. So like finding a good, protein product that's packaged like that without really a lot of processed stuff or extra calories or extra sugar um, sometimes hard to find. Yeah, definitely agree. It, it can be hard to find, but that's where we just have to keep searching and keep looking at labels. Any other questions that I can answer for you guys about this? Love beef jerky, Brendan. Yeah, beef jerky is good. <laughs> You work next to the beef jerky store. Nice. <laughs> there you go. Well, you can bet their ingredients and see if they have something good or whether you're like, ah, you guys are full of crap. All righty, gang. If no other questions about this, feel free if something does come up, you can throw it into the Facebook nutrition group as well or hit me up with an email. And uh, that's pretty much it. Hopefully you gain some good insight about how to look at nutrition and the labels that you're reading and why you're reading them like that. Awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, team. Thank you for uh, just showing up today. Right. Great stuff. And uh, again, this is really valuable content for both coach Amy and for MFP as we'll use this for, uh, for content on social media to help promote um, fueling fitness, nutrition, and for MFP. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time today. Happy Sunday.